So good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Damro, and I serve TURF as the executive assistant. Thank you very much for joining us today. We appreciate your coming here. And I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Kathleen Bailey of the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. She's going to kick off our session here in just a moment. But first, I want to point out the coffee and tea service, which is being sponsored by Lorraine DeMatos and our staff at the Cultura in Glacier in Sao Paulo. And we appreciate her efforts very much. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Ryan. Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here to welcome to you to this TURF panel presentation. We're very, very grateful to TESOL for allowing us this spot on the program again this year. And as Ryan said, to the Jordan Jason for providing the coffee. It's really nice that you could be with us. For those of you who don't know, the International Research Foundation for English Language Education, anonymized as TURF, was started by TESOL in 1998. And I actually see some people in this room who voted the motion forward to establish TURF. Would it embarrass you terribly if I asked you to stand up, those of you who were part of the foundation of the foundation? So Denise, Matt, Natalie, David, thank you so much for getting us started. I also want to recognize a couple of other people. Um, we have a wonderful relationship with Naomi Silverman at Routledge, who entered into a contract with us to publish research books based on the studies that have been funded by TURF in our doctoral dissertation grant program. The first book came out last year, and it was about the teaching and learning of English in the Arabic-speaking world. And I'm happy to tell you that the second book, hot off the presses, is here. It was edited by Marianne Christensen, Donna Christian, uh, Patsy Duff, and Nina Spada, and the title is Teaching and Learning English Grammar, Research Findings and Future Directions. There's a flyer about the book on your seat. We're so happy to be able to dedicate this book to Betty Azar, who was a wonderful supporter of the foundation for many years and has been a great inspiration to us all. So Naomi, thank you, appreciate it. Okay. I also would like to recognize the current and past trustees of TURF. So some of you just stood up are going to need to stand up again. But can I have all of my trustees stand and be recognized, please? Thank you so much. Uh, the trustees that work for TURF serve as volunteers. They don't get paid. In fact, it costs them a lot of money. We never pay for their travel. We never pay for their hotels. We expect them to do a great deal of volunteer service. So I'm really grateful to them for being here. Um, I also want to recognize any grant recipients that might be in the room. Is there anyone here who's received a grant from her in the past? Can't stand up. Nice to see you. Thanks for being here. Okay, and then another group that I really want to recognize is anyone who's ever donated to Turk. So if you've made a contribution, a financial contribution to her, it would be good to stand up and help. Thank you very much. And I also think that there are people in the room who have helped us wonderfully by reading the proposals for the doctoral dissertation grant competition. If you've ever served as a proposal reviewer, would you stand up to please? Okay, thank you. Now, if there's anyone who did not get a chance to stand up, I won't make you stand, but I'm going to put you in the category of potential donors. <laughs> All right? So as we go through the program today, please think about the work that Truth is doing with its volunteer board and our one staff member, Ryan Danro. Okay. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel now. And I just want to point out to you that on your seat, there's a little bookmark that gives you the Truth website, and it tells you some of the things we do. So, for example, it says over 133 downloadable reference lists. That figure is now 150. So please have a look at the website. There are lots of these bookmarks here if you'd like to take some home to your students or colleagues. All right? In terms of our panel presentation this morning, the title is Building Bridges in Language Planning, Teacher Development, Research, and Assessment. We're very concerned about helping uh, researchers and teachers who are working in or working on language issues in the under-resourced parts of our world. I'm going to just tell you the brief order of presentation of our panelists. We're going to start with our colleague John Nagg from the British Council. 
followed by Nick Savile from Cambridge English Language Assessment, and then Carrie Hannon from the U.S. Department of State. Sorry, not your next Yes, I'm after Nick. Okay, so after Nick, Nick will be Marianne Christensen, University of Utah, then Carrie from the Department of State, followed by incoming T-Small President Andy Curtis, who very kindly uh, agreed to spend some time with us today, even though he has to pop in and out and go to other ceremonial functions. So let me just ask you, please, each speaker is going to have a very brief 10 minutes to share with you his or her ideas. I'm going to ask you to hold your questions for the end instead of speaking to each speaker individually with your questions because we hope to have a really lively and uh, in-depth conversation when the speakers are finished. Okay? So we're going to start with John. Um, Ryan, are you time? I lost Ryan. Tim, do you have a watch? Could you time for me, please? Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So we'll start with John. photo of a recent research report from commissioned by the UK's Department of International Development. This research uh, aimed to identify the most effective pedagogical practices in developing countries. So what do you think? Are you optimistic or pessimistic about children's learning? On a glass half full day, you might celebrate the fact that the children aren't at school. There's somewhere to sit. The teacher is not only in class, but apparently engaged, communicating with the children. Some of them seem to have papers in a class small enough to allow for individual attention. On a different day, you might bemoan the lack of resources, wonder where the technology is, I wonder if there's any electricity. Is the boy standing, being punished for the children hungry? In flitting through these slides, I look at some research, which is all freely available online. I look at some positions I endeavour to maintain on behalf of the British Council, and some projects and practices, hoping to identify some themes that those aiming to improve education in poorer countries need to take into account, whether they're insiders working with very limited budgets, or outsiders sometimes, like the British Council, with the responsibility of spending international development aid effectively, aid funds that are available for countries on the OECD list of lower and middle income countries. Recent research commissioned by the Department of International Development in the UK gives a flavour of trends in the field. An interest in finding realistic and pragmatic solutions in difficult situations. A desire to promote equity, especially gender and the urban rural divide. And an acceptance that the background political economy of the education system is vitally important in finding solutions. Westbrook's findings of effective pedagogy, and this is on the DFID website, if you just Google it, show three teacher strategies and six specific pedagogical techniques and practices that do lead to student learning. In sum, teaching works when it's seen as a social process, not a delivery job. What does a social process look like? You know it when you see it. Fenton Whelan's excellent paper comes to similar conclusions about what works in resource poor environments materials and ongoing support for teachers, basic facilities, time on tasks, strong management, and once again, the need to teach in a language that the children understand. And I stress I talk about education in general, not just language. 
the sad implication of both these studies is, of course, of these good practices, not rocket science, and more often than not, not in place in many low and middle income countries. <laughs> language of instruction in many countries, especially in Africa <coughs> and South Asia, is a particular issue where educationalists have attempted for years to persuade policymakers of some sound basic principles. The wrong language policy can be a real break on student learning, and beyond that, a break on national and social development. We see many case situations where mother tongue based multilingual education is the right way forward. And the reality that a child cannot learn things in a language that he does not understand cannot be so difficult to grasp. You can see here that the children not only understand what's going on, but enjoy another social. Our British Council projects in the developing world aim to use the best evidence and research findings to improve student outcomes through supporting authorities in choosing the right policies and in managing education reform processes. Often, but not exclusively, focused on teacher education and teacher training. Even difficult and contentious issues and decisions, such as the recent Rwandan government's decision to switch from French to English medium in schools, and efforts to include the mother tongue appropriately, can be turned to the best effect by careful planning. In this case, a language-centered approach to the whole curriculum. Each context is different. And every project needs its distinct design, taking account of the many social, cultural, and economic and educational factors. We have a number of broad models for English language reform projects, including the development of um, master, national master trainer cadres, mentoring of teachers in their own school environments. The photo that photograph is of um, our expert mentors traveling to see their mentee teachers by canoe in East Malaysia. Nice way to go to work. <laughs> Language improvement, as well as methodology, and a judicious and locally appropriate use of technology. In general, we've been able to crystallize a small number of key lessons for successful large-scale reform projects. First, take time to involve all stakeholders, teachers, schools, local communities, and hierarchies, parents, as well as children. Second, don't neglect any elements of the educational mix. Not only well-trained teachers, but also an appropriate curriculum, well-aligned assessment, and effective management of quality assurance. Thirdly, use small-scale pilot programs to show successful models. And fourthly, decentralize the development of local solutions to those who know the political context. In the end, there's no magic solution. Having improved access, <coughs> the world's improved access to schooling for millions across the developing world over the last 20 years. But access isn't enough. There remain huge problems in ensuring that learning takes place when students are at school. This can only happen case by case, district by district, school by school, teacher by teacher. Child, my child. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. My name is
is Nick. I'm from the University of Cambridge, where we do English language assessment. So I'm picking up the piece from the title about assessment. And throughout my talk, I'm going to be showing you some diagrams, which are, in fact, picking up on the concept of the bridge, or bridging is a metaphor of how you join things together. And that's one of the main points in my talk. And the diagrams, I have to acknowledge, were done by my colleague, Neil Jones, who I've been writing a paper with, which I can give you a reference to at the end. But one point I'd like to make is that my comments are not just applicable to developing countries in contexts of under-resourcing, but any part of the world, any context, where education reforms in language education are being planned and implemented. Because I think development is something which goes on all the time, not just uh, in the underdeveloped context. So I'm going to just summarize very quickly my pitch and then take you through some of these slides, which very quickly will illustrate the points I want to make. So <clears throat> Underlying everything, languages are life skills, not just academic subjects to be learned in school and then forgotten. And English, above all, is being seen in this functional way now. Language assessment in this context is often thought of simply as a way of providing students or potential employees with the information about what level has been reached, so the sensitivity proficiency. However, I would like to suggest that assessment and various forms of testing can play a much more powerful role and that our focus should be on linking school learning with wider society. The challenge for us here is to link all levels of assessment into a coherent model to improve learning processes and learning outcomes. And in this, I'd argue we need to adopt a learning-oriented approach that locates learning at the heart of all assessment contexts, from classroom tasks, classroom assessment, progress tests, continuum assessment, to high stakes tests and exams of the kind that we do in Cambridge. On the one hand, we must enable international standards to be met and to be raised over time, so improvement, development. The labour market clearly needs to be able to rely on the outcomes of the school system when recruiting staff and to meet the needs of their companies in a globalized world where communication skills are increasingly important. On the other hand, we must empower teachers and learners to set their own individualized goals, to monitor performance and to make decisions about the next step learners to take in making their own progress in their own development. The aim, therefore, must be to define complementary roles for the expertise of teachers and ex experts in assessment like the ones in my department. So we're all in it together. So that's the that's pitch. Now let me just uh, talk a little bit more. <clears throat> the challenge is not insignificant because even in developed countries, the outcomes of learning education are not at the levels that people would like. So this is a survey we did a few years ago which in Europe, which of course is very diverse and some, some parts are relatively underdeveloped, but after eight or nine years of schooling, children are not getting beyond, on average, the lower intermediate levels. And for functional purposes, that's not enough. The European Survey of Language Competencies therefore concluded that educational systems must step up their efforts to prepare more, or practically all students for the language market, the labor market, sorry, and that educational reforms should address the creation of language-friendly living and learning environments inside and out of school. And here's the, the metaphor developing of bridging. How do we do that bridging? So it's not just about proficiency. <clears throat> here's a challenge which we've set ourselves, which is to link high-stakes certificate exams into a system, systemic or systematic relationship with all of the assessment which occurs in classrooms. And we need, in order to do this, to support language-friendly living and learning environments outside and inside school, what I would call, and colleagues in Cambridge call, an extended learning ecology. And this is a word that's emerging, this idea of linking again in an ecological way. So focusing on learning outcomes, we need to bring together the traditional ideas of 
summative assessment, large scale exams, with formative assessments to focus on what counts, which is the learner and the learning context. So learning outcomes need to be more at the heart of what we do. This, this, this approach or this idea locates learning at the heart of every assessment context, and it seeks to empower the teachers and the learners to set their own individualized goals. This word empower, we've heard it all, to um, give people agency over what they do, and to make um, decisions about how they progress. But we also do need, and this is required by governments and, and employers, to be able to match our achievements against standards and to see development as the improvement of standards over time. So in, in building bridges, I'd suggest we need two tools, which are in, in a sense are the metaphors uh, for understanding progression development, which have, um, the framework needs to have vertical and horizontal dimensions and to be able to implement this learning oriented assessment. And going forward, we need innovative uses of digital technology. When every child can have a $20 smartphone, the world can be changed and transformed in ways we can't quite do at the moment. But that would be very helpful in creating the language learning ecology I'm talking about. One of the basic problems I observe in, in K-12 type education around the world is that every time you move from primary to middle school to high school, you keep looping back to the beginning. Because no one trusts what the other teachers did, right? So you have to go back to the beginning. And so you get this sort of go up and then back and go up and then back. What we need is a system which allows some form of progression to be monitored and communicated across different schools, different teachers, different contexts. So again, bridging. How do we do this? Um, well, there are two dimensions here in this framework. One is a vertical one, which I think has to have quantitative dimensions, to be a measurement perspective. And you need to be able to line people up who are better than others in certain traits of uh, ability, and to be able to do that reliably and consistently. That's what tests and assessments do well. And you need to be able to do it with regard to different skills, different um, abilities, not just in one narrow way. And you can use frameworks which exist. So the common framework of reference which originated in Europe is now providing quite a good system for this. It's, it's ubiquitous from Chile to China, and uh, people are importing it. They're not having it thrust on them, and they're finding it useful. But on the other hand, we don't want to homogenize everybody. We need to take into account individual differences, which I would call the qualitative dimension, uh, to be able to see people not just as categories, but as individuals within the group, as we saw in perhaps in the children uh, which John showed. And that zone, the zone of proximal development, where the learners are, um, and is currently the domain of the teacher, how to individualize what's going on to give each, each learner um, their own experience. <coughs> so that's one metaphor, which is the up and across the other is we need some way of representing what I call the four intersecting, intersecting worlds of learning. The personal world, the social world, the world of education, and at the heart of this, at least what I think, the world of assessment. So here we are. Let's represent it in this diagram. The personal world is the learner. That's, that's what you have to keep it focusing on. That learner's cognition, that learner's personality, that learner's uh, interests, that's where the intrinsic motivation for learning a language comes from. You have to inspire that learner. We just heard the debate about community competence. Uh, Lord is Ortega talking about this. Um, but the social world needs to interact with that learner in order to provide the affordances for learning. And the ex extrinsic motivation, what are you going to do with your language? Are you going to get a better job? Are you going to go to university? Are you going to, um, <coughs> become a better person in, in your societal context in different ways. And schooling and assessment, therefore, have to be brought to bear on those in a linked up way. At the center of that is the learning context, the, the, the learning task, which inherently has assessment built into it. We, we call it feedback, or we call it scaffolding. And various forms of, of feedback are possible. You can't really learn in a form that um, 
setting, it, unless you're given some feedback about what progress you're making. And this, this bit with the task at the center is fundamental. So what we're trying to do here is to link up this, this ecology where formal learning in the school and natural acquisition in society can be brought together. So this, this effectively extends the classroom into society. It's not just about what goes on between those four walls or non-four walls, as we saw in the picture where you've got the cluster of students coming together in a class environment. The classroom is now much bigger than that. So in summary, and I've only got one more minute, in school learning is a social process and it must concern personal development. And in order to do that, you have to create the activities, the tasks, which give you the basis for learning, for learning a language. And if we're going to do this with assessment, we have to align uh, teaching and assessment goals. So what we're trying to do is to create this model, which has all of these diff different components, which allows learning to go on in the way I've suggested, but can, all work, can provide records, uh, feedback models, and uh, improvements, uh, which meet the, the needs of the local context. Digital technology to the rest <coughs> Well, perhaps, but one of the things it will do, which will transform what's currently possible, it will enable new forms of interaction and capture new forms of evidence. It will assist teachers in ways that they can um, create the authentic tasks, and in so doing, it can also remove administrative burdens of collecting and processing information, which are fundamental for assessment. But it's not about the, not about the machine. It's about the virtuous combination of humans and machines, the teacher will need to change her role to adapt to these um, new knowledge and skills, to take on board the concept of this ecology, ecological model, and in, in relation to assessment, we'll need to adapt, um, develop what we're calling in our profession higher levels of assessment literacy. So, thank you. I can give you a reference to the paper later if you like. So that uh, you can navigate this on your own if you haven't done this already. 
So uh, when you get on our homepage, um, at the very bottom, can you see along the bottom, it's got TURF publications, TURF sponsored research, donating to TURF, which is very important, um, and access to resources. So that's what I want you to think about clicking on. Okay. So when you click on that, you will be taken to a page that looks like this. And on the right-hand side in that square are a lot of different things that you can click on, and all of these resources are free. So let's do the very first one here, which is our reference list. So in the work that I do at the University of Utah, my students um, range from knowing a lot about the field to knowing nothing about the field. So they come in and they want to know, where do I go for this, where do I go for that? And I send them first here to the reference list. So you will see, Kathy told you this morning, that we now have over 150 topics of interest to teachers and researchers. So if you're a new researcher, okay, this is wonderful. If you're someone like me who's old and been in the field a very long time, this is wonderful. Okay. So when you click on that, um, you'll be taken to uh, all of these different uh, references. So they're very, very useful, 150 different areas. And guess what? They're free. It's free. And so at the very end, I'm going to ask that question to you again. And you will all be able to stand up because this is something that's free that was actually useful. You know, not something that, free, that was free, that was not useful. So links. I'm often asked questions about where do I go for this, where do I go for that. There are other places besides TESOL. And so TURF has uh, collected all of these different links to different associations and organizations. And um, that's very, very, very useful and very helpful. Okay, so research organizations. So if you're doing research, these links also focus on um, research organizations. And the links not only will take you there, but they provide links to activities as well as links to resources. Now, we have many journals in our field, and it continues to grow. And sometimes it's very confusing to know exactly what journals to look at and which ones are associated with the work that we do in English language teaching. So there is a click a link there that will take you to journals and a list of journals, and those are tagged by whether the journal is geared towards researchers, testers, teachers, program administrators, or parents, and other stakeholders. And then also whether the journal permits free online access. So that's very important, and many of them do. Um, teachers, so teacher associations, although we're all here, because we belong to TESOL and support TESOL. There are other teacher organizations that can be very useful. Over 80 associations are listed at this time. So this gives you a nice link. So how many of you in here have ever published? Oh, lovely. I'm so happy to see hands up. How many of you have not published but would like to publish? There you go, a number of hands. So this is a wonderful link because it answers uh, questions about publishing, gives you calls for participation from different publishers in our field, and is regularly updated every time um, we receive a new publication. So it's very, very useful. Conference opportunities. So when you think about attending conferences, I think you all get excited, and it's probably not just because you travel to a new place. Have you ever been in Toronto before? How many new time, new first-timers in Toronto? See, a bunch of people. So I know you're excited to be here, right? OK. Um, but also, you were excited to be here because conferences give us an opportunity to attend sessions, to learn new things, to network. And that is extremely important. Um, so right now, on the TURF website, we have listed upcoming conferences. Maybe it's too expensive to go to a conference, uh, maybe in Toronto, if you're living in uh, Lima, Peru, um, or uh, somewhere some distance away. But there might be a conference listed there that is close that you could plan to attend. So practical resources. Um, so these are resources for actually for language teachers. And they're all free if the link is there and you can click on them. For example, uh, UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles, 
um, has a language materials project that is very useful. I clicked on that. But this page is under construction, so we're always adding new things to this page, always keeping Ryan busy with the things that um, Turf is, is, is putting on this page. So um, how many of you have ever had a grant, a fellowship, or an award? I'm so happy to see that. How does it make you feel? Doesn't it? Yeah, it makes you feel so good when you get an award or a grant because it's not only that you get might be associated with money, but it's also a recognition that your work is being valued by the field. And so here we are publicizing funding opportunities in addition to TERF funding opportunities. And on April 22nd, we have the 2015 uh, doctoral dissertation grant competitions. So if you are a professor working with uh, PhD students, please check out um, um, our, uh, the information online. If you are a student thinking that you might want to apply, you just started your program, or you're even thinking it about a PhD in the future, please visit that information because uh, the deadline is April 22nd of 2015, and this is an annual competition. We also have 15 turf presentations and slide casts um, online from previous conventions and work that we have done at other, other conventions. And so the uh, slide presentations are not only the PowerPoints, but also the audio, and they're also free. We have annotated bibliography. So not just the reference list, but the annotated bibliography, which tells you all about the individual things in the reference list, and you can decide whether or not you want to pursue that and want to look at it. Free online training. So there are links to uh, the National Institutes for Health online training for um, protecting human resources. So if you're doing research and it involves human resources, you want to do things in the right way. So it protects your subjects. Um, and valuable information for MA and PhD candidates who expect to collect data from people. We have free software and a guide to using a statistical package called R. And that's free and it's downloadable and also a free book called A Guide to Doing Statistics in Second Language Research Using R. So this is all uh, very, very helpful if you're doing your own um, um, statistics and you're trying to learn how to do that. And then, of course, our own DDG um, proposals. Um, we are trying so hard to help, uh, if this is your first time applying, it's a good grant to apply for, you know, because we have so much material online to help you and to support you in that process, including something we've been working on, which is frequently asked questions. So if you're thinking to apply, please check out everything and go through things step by step because it will help you um, develop the very best application that you can. So all of the above um, are resources, and they're all free. I'm going to try a little something with you for just a moment. I would like you to all stand up for just a minute, if you would. I'm going to switch task and response, and you can see how that works. So would you all stand up? Oh, thank you so much. So now I'm going to ask you, how many of you are willing to uh, view TERF's website and click on it. If you are, would you stand up? <laughs> How many of you are thinking that you are definitely going to become a potential donor of TERF? If you are, would you stand up? <laughs> okay. You can all sit down now. <laughs> But thank you. I mean, it's the most overwhelming response I've ever had to those questions. <laughs> so um, I think uh, we will save questions for the end, but thank you so much. And I truly mean this. I hope that you will visit our site. I sincerely hope that you will contribute to the mission of TURF. We are a volunteer organization, a foundation. Everything that we do, we do because we love this profession and we want to, to, to further research and to 
um, to support English language teaching and research. Thank you so much. These are 
are designed for teens and young adults at the pre intermediate level and up, and will combine content and language studies to help students better understand topics that are actually central to our diplomacy. Um, this is one of our um, access program counts. So at any given time, we have 30,000 teenagers. Um, 13 to 20 from low resource communities taking part in our scholarship program. We've reached 80,000 since the program started in early 2000 in Morocco. It offers a full two years of after school English education, English language instruction. And in these photos, you can see access students in, Europe, in Egypt participating in the unique immersion camp that's part of our program. They range in, they combine leadership building, teamwork, English language instruction, and they range from offsite day long activities to multi week classes. They offer students a chance to improve their English and gain confidence in the language. Um, such classes also serve as models for local ministries of education interested in updating their approach to foreign language instruction, and it also opened doors for us to communities that we aren't previously able to access. Finally, we are uh, using English for specific purposes to address the needs of underserved learners. So this is a little bit broader interpretation of under-resourced. But this is an ESP project in Europe focused on law enforcement, journalism, and aviation industry. So we have an English language fellow, Daniel Perez, who developed an English for police program for law enforcement officers in Prague and Bratislava. A combination of classes and e-readers were used to help police work more effectively with cross-border law enforcement and in the area of tourism. Um, other ESP projects that we have done include English classes for government officials in Belgrade who are helping Serbia make progress on European Union access and implement the necessary democratic and economic reforms. Our various legal English programs across the region in Romania, Albania, Macedonia, and previously in Turkey have helped strengthen the rule of law, promote ethical reform in the judiciary and the government at large, and have worked to help reduce corruption. At our Budapest-based RELO, organized an English for Journalists blended course that is currently being violated in 10 countries across Central and Eastern Europe. It was developed to help promote press freedom, transparency, the reporting of corruption, anti-censorship, and data-driven um, journalism. So you can see the U.S. Uh, Department of State is using English in a lot of very creative ways. Um, and then I will end with one last thing, which is English Teaching Forum, which I hope all of you are familiar with. And those of you who said you wanted to be published, here's an opportunity. But it's important to note that we were pushed in Washington to go digital, to go digital, to go digital. And we fought the battle to keep a print circulation because 80,000 of these are in the hands of teachers who have no access to um, computers and electricity. And I can't tell you how many realists have told me they have gone to the remotest village in the smallest place in the world and found a photocopied article of forum being used to teach 80 kids sitting around a tree. So it's it's a great contribution that we continue to hope that you can contribute back to. So that's it. Thank you. Ten minutes on each of those. 
Yes. Needless to say, with the typically absurd over-ambitiousness of people in our field, each of those areas, language planning, teaching development, research and assessments, are entire series of books and entire conferences. So it, it's been interesting. My role is to do a couple of things. Um, one is to join <coughs> some of the dots and to oh, that's a point. <laughs> is to join some of the dots, make some of the connections with our four previous speakers, and then as you go into your question and answer time, to make some uh, provocative, thought-provoking statements and then leave the room. <laughs> One of the interesting things about being a TESOL president, and we have um, one of the highest concentration in this room of past, present, and future presidents of the association, so people will know that um, there is a, a space-time continuum within these convention centers. And growing up as a geeky kid born and raised in England, um, who also recently mourned the passing of Dr. Spock, and I, I, I was always fascinated by space and time. And when you get to be a TESOL president, the cool thing is you cross the continuum. Because I am simultaneously in two other places at this moment, <laughs> and at any given moment in time, in two other spaces. So um, I will try and get back for the Q&A, but I thought it might be fun just to light a few firecrackers, throw them into the crowd, and then step away. But I will be back if I can. <laughs> so, in terms of connecting the dots, John Nack from the British Council started with some of those wonderful visuals. And a statement that I don't often see, but it's maybe, I was thinking, why don't I often see that on the slide? And because it's so obvious and so true, we don't always comment on it. So, I was glad to see the slide that said, You cannot learn things through a language you don't understand. <laughs> And why are we still having some of those, as you said, how hard can we be to get that? Um, Nick Savile uh, talked about, and followed up on, on your comments about language-centered approaches, on um, uh, John's comments about language-centered approaches, and Nick Savile talked about um, learning-oriented approaches. And there was that lovely, slight, slip of the tongue between the language market and the labour market, which was, a, was a, a good connection, actually, even though you kind of backed up, I thought, yeah, language markets and labour markets. There was also talk of ecological approaches, which for me always uh, triggers fun memories of layer one layer, another colleague whose morning we recently passed. So these ideas led to, uh, in many of the speakers' talks, the notion of the centrality of context. There's a lot of talk about context, but it's really been at the periphery. Oh yes, context is important, context is important. Well, yes, but I would say that it's more than important. I would actually say that there's a centrality of context. in, And teachers have understood that, I think, for a long time. And it's the other fields that are coming on board, in a way. Um, this is my third consecutive conference this year, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we started at the Language Testing Research Colloquium, um, which we had a panel talk about context. That was the big thing that came up. And then after that, there was the American Association of Applied Linguistics last week, and now Chiefs on this week. So some of your Q&A may refer to notions of context. So I'll, I'll give a couple of brief examples of possibly provocative and only mildly offensive comments <laughs> that you may want to take in your Q&A session in a couple of Why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> this is me being presidential. I'm being good here. <laughs> the centrality of concept. So when I was in China, traveling around, and I said, you know what, guys? We're talking about the common European framework of reference for languages. And as it said, it's a tour of the world. I said, why don't we do this? Why don't we? Because we've got far more learners of English than all the rest of the world combined in China. Let's come up with a common Chinese framework of reference for languages, turn up in Europe and start saying. And the Chinese and the Europeans all laughed. They didn't get the irony. 
because the I goes to the first acronym, which is normal. That's how we, we read that to write. So we look at the commonality, and there is a good deal of commonality. But if we're going to say context is central, then what happened to the E? The European, it's not called the common global, was never meant to be, as I understand it, a common global framework. So in your question and answer, I don't offer that as a criticism, I offer that as a talking point. If centrality is concept, is, is context is central, then how does that fit the notion of something developed in one context being used tens of thousands of miles away? So, having seen to it that I don't work for the British Council, <laughs> let me just uh, do that for the State Department. Because one of the interesting concepts that, that came up in the talk, uh, apart from very good work, and I should say that all four speakers, for me one of the recurring themes was the amazing amount of good work that's been done. So I do not want to take anything away from that. But because of someone who has been raised in various critical contexts, one of the things that we do discuss at TESOL, and which does relate to Kerry's talk, is the post-colonial positioning of English language teaching. We talk about bringing democracy to countries, whether they want it or not, with a notion that more democracy is better than less. And a given assumption, an unquestioned assumption, and an even bigger assumption that we all mean the same thing when we say democracy. So, uh, I will now um, leave the room. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to have one round of There's a wall of past presidents at the back. Right. <laughs> so, um, as Kathy mentioned, I am at a number of other events up and down the corridor. Uh, I will try to get back. We have 30 minutes for Q&A, and the speakers did an amazing job of keeping to their 10 minutes to allow people enough time for Q&A. So I will leave you with some of those thoughts. Um, centrality of context, commonality of what we do, and just to be a little bit provocative, uh, the post-colonial positioning of language testing assessment, post-colonial positioning of English in the world, what that means, how we do it, and what that says about the future of these various fields. So I will conclude by thanking TURF again for putting together this panel, by thanking the TESOL Association. I will mention to them that um, you need about 15 minutes to get from the plenary <laughs> to the next session. I'll, I'll be sure to put that on my notes. Um, we're thinking of having those things that you drive, when you drive around the airport, those <laughs> golf buggies, the, the place is big enough. You can definitely do that. So uh, with those thanks, and to, thanks again very much to the four speakers, to the standing room only, sit on the ground if necessary, the 1960s and not dead. Um, audience, thank you all very much indeed. So one of our purposes in having these four very brief, short, snappy presentations was to get some ideas on the floor and then to generate lots of question and answer. We wanted to have ample time for discussion. So let me ask you to do a few things. First, I think it would be beneficial if the speakers can hear everyone. So if you have a comment or a question that you'd like to share, would you stand up and use your teacher voice and start by telling us where you work so that we have the context that Andy referred to. I'll remind you that our speakers were John Nagg from the British Council, Nick Saddle from Cambridge English Language Assessment, uh, Marianne Christensen from the University of Utah and the Turf Board of Trustees, Actually, all of these guys are on the Turf Board of Trustees. And then Carrie Hannon from the uh, US State Department. And um, Andy, who just left the room after a typical Andy thing, right? Was that typical? Those of you who know Andy? Yes. OK, so who's got a reaction, a question, or a comment? Please start with your name, where you work, and speak loudly.
that goes on in the language of the country by learning English. So that's one specific example I'd like to understand why we feel that in all these countries, people will be better professionals and better citizens by knowing a language that's not the language of the business of that country. And then a second example, I worked for a while as an English language fellow in Colombia, and I was amazed to find that the Colombian government and the you know, State Department had this rule that it was kind of like what was mentioned with one of these other countries. You know, everybody bilingual by 2018, I think it was. And so for that purpose, all these Colombian teachers who had never spoken a word of English in their lives were now being asked to be English teachers of their children so that those kids could magically become bilingual in a few years being taught by Colombian teachers who were not fluent in English and were like flailing at the desperation of what they were being asked to do. So those are two things that I would, you know, two examples that I would like to address. So the, the, to answer the second question, it should be noted that it's the government of Colombia asking for help to promote English teaching by 2018, and we're facing the how do we help them do that when most of their teachers don't have English to do it. So it's not us implementing that on the government. It's government's coming to us asking for that. Now, then the argument can happen, is that the right way to pursue English language education to improve economic prosperity for them? But that's a question that has to be worked at a much larger level across many countries. As far as, far as journalism or any of the fields, for better or worse, academic writing in the STEM fields is done in English. Um, universities in Russia came to us asking to improve their academic standards. They want to be some of the, they want to be listed in the top 100 universities in the world. In order to do that, they have to publish in English. Is it fair? Is it, um, some English is the global language, and a lot of academics are done in English. And all of those teachers, all of those journalists, um, assuming masters in their own language, but speaking English gives them access to additional information and an opportunity to do research in a second language. So if I simplified it by saying that learning English would make them less corrupt, I should have said that speaking English would give them the tools to address issues of corruption because it will allow them to look for wider sources and to engage with journalists outside of their normal circles. And I have seen that across many um, context within which I've worked, for example, in Afghanistan, where um, I worked closely with Afghan journalists, and those that spoke English were better able to get access to accurate information from the military, which is really important. So, as an example, in our military, always gives very accurate. Oh, don't. That's a. <laughs> 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 well, it's a good thing Andy was out of the room for that. Yeah, it's an interesting set of issues. Um, some of the people that are a little bit older will remember that at the fall of the Soviet Union, teachers throughout Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan, who had been teachers in Russia, were almost overnight converted to be teachers of English without perhaps proper training or support. It's a really tricky political issue. Yeah, other comments or questions for him? Yes, please. Could you tell us your name and where you work?
And what tools can you leverage for that to happen? If you just have proficiency measures, you almost inevitably get that negative washback effect where the measure becomes more important than the learning processes and the learning that you need uh, actually to get to that level. So you get very negative behaviors like cramming or, or cheating or whatever. That's not appropriate. So it is, however, useful to have external measures which have some comparative potential for comparing outcomes of education. And most policymakers want that. And indeed, most um, teachers in the, and other um, participants are happy with that, but it, not if it kills off the learning process. So my proposition is, how do you bring learning, which happens in classrooms, which is scaffolded by teachers who have the knowledge of the students, into an alignment with what's needed to actually meet realistic policy goals? And I suggested we need some tools, some ways of creating bridging between schools and society, between educators and assessment people, in order to try and create that convergence for positive impact and positive outcomes. Now that's not easy because there's lots of interests and lots of lack of knowledge, lack, and it's the under-resourcing sometimes which also contributes. But the, the tools which are available, and we heard from Mac, Mac about some, can actually help to create the common understandings. And contrary to what was said by Andy, I strongly believe in the, the common European framework of reference as a tool, not for imperialism or imposition, but a way of creating a common language to talk about the issues. The tool itself does not imply you have to adopt it or, or you can adapt it or ignore it, but many of the commonalities which Andy referred to can help to address the issues you just pointed to about how tests often don't align with what teachers want to do. If you can have good tests which are construct relevant and you have good understanding of how you develop language skills, you can be scaffolding individuals while at the same time preparing for external tests which are not in not going in opposite directions. How do we achieve that is my question. I was also really interested in this point that um, as teachers, we need to know about assessment. You refer to the term assessment literacy. And one of the things we need to be able to do is explain assessment to students, to parents, to policy makers, to employers, and so on. So I think we have a responsibility to try to bridge that gap. I saw a question from the gentleman in the back much earlier. Yeah, Did you subjects on the university entrance exam. 
Thank you, Stephen. And you reminded me that John made the distinction or referred to the discrepancy, perhaps is the right word, between rural and urban contexts. So, did any of you guys want to comment, or can I just go along with the audience? Okay. The lady in green, please. This might be a po I'm Nancy Apples, and I'm, I'm kind of retired, and I go on projects we as organized. Um, but I, I, this might be a positive. I was in Martinia this fall, and they needed to rewrite their whole university curriculum. Yeah. And it did seem like an imposed European thing we had to get connected to. But we did, they didn't have standards of what we were going to try to achieve, and we went to that common European framework of reference. But, and then to get it, well, what is this going to mean for university students? I have friends in Albania who've moved it into an Albanian context about what, how you spell those things out. And theirs wasn't copyrighted, so I asked, and they sent us the Albanian version of the common European print. And we very quickly went to work to make some changes to make it more Albanian. And one of the basic ones was that we, at the very beginning level, you can talk about your family. You know, that's that kind of stuff. You can say, I have six brothers and all of that. There seems to be a, a fairly large segment of Martini society where that's inappropriate to talk about. And I, what's this? Well, you may have slaves in your family, or you may have former slaves in your family, and you don't want to talk about that, or you come from a slave background, and you don't want to talk about that. So for me, it was odd as can be that we don't learn to talk about our brothers and sisters, but in Mauritania, we look at the students. Is that an example of contextualizing? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I saw some other hands. There's been a suggestion from the panel that you might want to stop the back and forth Q&A and just talk to one another. Is there someone who wanted to make a statement to the group or ask a question to the group before we stop this, please, can you tell us your name and where you're from? Sure. Um, I'm Beth Parker. I go from Teachers College at Purdue University in New York. And I'm a former uh, DDG grant recipient in 2011. So I just wanted to say thanks publicly to Turk and to send myself to graduate students here who might be interested in applying for the grant. It really helped me through my dissertation work. It really provided the encouragement that I needed um, for a big study in public schools in Pennsylvania, working with English language learners, a really time involved and uh, um, <laughs> a really involved study. Uh, and the support from, from Turk really, really helped me. So if anybody um, has particular questions about that, I'm here and I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Ben.
let me uh, wrap up by reminding you that the bookmarks have a website address that Matt shared with you. We encourage you to have a look. Also, I want to thank our panelists. There's still coffee outside. This was not a ticketed event. You're welcome to the coffee. Would you join me in thanking not only the panelists, but our wonderful executive assistant, Brian Damrell, for setting up this